prefer the routers in the core of the network. And so basically we're going to be doing flat routing. We have no hierarchy. So every slot in an expensive core router here will equal a dentist office, a, um, a 7-Eleven store or whatever. And so that's, a, that's a, a routing architecture scaling problem that we have to address. Now we believe that's going to be around 10 million routes and growing. So that's pretty large. And today we can't really practically support 10 million routes in a FIB. But after LISP, what we can do is if we separate the address be um, between a locator and an ID, that the locators are the only things that are injected into routing, and they could follow this topology as you see it. So we think now that the core routers that are inside that red circle will only have to store state roughly equivalent to the number of boxes that are in, or the number of routes that are inside that yellow circle. And we think that's dressed, oops, we think that's drastically a smaller number, probably, you know, 10 to the fourth or something. Um, and, when you think of it that way, you could actually implement a FIB with a 65,000 element array and just do a direct access to do forwarding. You wouldn't need to do complex data structures in your, in your hardware to, to do FIB forwarding. So the growth in multi-homing is really where we want to focus the LISP effort because not only do we have to fix the problem on the last side, slide, we also want to be able to provide features, useful features, to make it compelling to deploy the new technology. So basically you have a site and the number of multi-home sites are growing pretty rapidly. And a multi-home site is just, um, typically it is two or more routers, two or four, depending on what your redundancy level is and if you're multinational. And you have two routers connecting each with separate links to two different service providers. That's pretty much the basic definition of what a, a multi-home site looks like. Um, what we want to do is we want to improve site multi-homing. Um, today you can control which way packets egress because it's basically you take full routes in your site if you choose to get shortest path exits per destination. And it, when you just want the shortest exit, then you just inject the default route from R1, R2 in there, and then the sources that are closer to here use R2, and the sources that are closer to there use R1. So really the policy on how you egress packets are, is done locally, and that's quite nice. Of course, incoming, you don't have that um, luxury because it's some router in the middle of provider A or provider B that's doing uh, BGP um, shortest path uh, or best path selection that's deciding which packets come in. But we want the sites to be able to control their ingress traffic too, especially if you have sites that are not necessarily um, providing servers but more clients. And so all the HTTP return traffic is coming down. You want to be able to use your links that you're paying for. Um, so we want to be able to control that at the site and not have a BGP AS path or local pref or MED policy decide which way packets come in. And we want these boxes to be relatively low X. You need a PhD in BGP to get this to work today with longest path, uh, longest uh, match lookups and uh, running BGP and playing around with policies. It's pretty difficult right now to, to, to make that work. So our goal is, is to possibly not, if BGP is running there now, that you'd be able to get all the policies and do them locally without running BGP in those CPE routers. Now, if we can improve site multi-homing, if this is a service provider where it's acting as transit, we could also do um, the same sort of thing as well to con because service providers today can't control their ingress uh, packet flow. So everybody just says it's a wash. I'll send you, I'm going to send you a bunch of stuff on these links because I know you're going to send it on, send them back to me on a different set of links, so it's just going to wash out. But so what we can do is with another level of indirection, we could actually use LISP to improve site uh, ISP multi-homing as well. Now, if we decouple the site addressing from the provider addressing, what we can do is we can avoid renumbering. What we do is if we have a set of addresses that are being used at the site that are not in the core routing tables and the core routers know nothing about it, you could actually allocate addresses there and never have to renumber again because it does, you don't have to um, worry about addressing the site to make the Internet scale. You can make it a local decision and it's completely decoupled. So you can be, you, you, can add, you can allocate lots of addresses to the um, source. You can decide what your exit and ingress policies are, and the core routers don't have to pay for it. So it's a local tax, not a, a, a uh, national tax. That's what's happening right now. Today, to do these sort of things, you have to inject more specific routes into the routing table. And if you inject a more specific sprint route into the AT&T network, they have to carry it all the way through. And so that means because you want ingress on that AT&T link, 
AT&T and everybody in the internet has to pay for an extra slot in the routing table for your ingress policy. So we really want to do things locally and um, be able to be good citizens uh, globally. So basically we'll have two separate uh, namespaces as null Chiapa calls them. They're really address domains where if you're just looking at IPv4 right here, there would be two different 2 to the 32 addressing domains. And the green ones throughout this presentation where you see green, we're talking about EID prefixes, endpoint ID prefixes. And where you see red, we're talking about locators. So the locators are the aggregatable entities that will be routed on, which the core routers will know about. And the EIDs will just be used to move packets around inside the green area and to be used for TCP connection IDs and that sort of thing. Okay. So if we can do these four basic multi-homing features at the same time, we reduce the size of the routing table, and this is goodness. So what do we have to do? We have to separate the IP address or separate the semantics of the IP address or break it apart or add another address. There's all kinds of ways of doing this. If you have a really long address, you could really break it apart pretty easily. Um, today, IPv6 and IPv4 addresses mean both who you are and where you are. So if you decide to move and you want to be able to be the same who, then you have to inject where you are into where you're where somewhere else and you can't um, aggregate. But here what you could do with an IPv6 address is you could say the lower order um, eight bytes um, are going to be an endpoint ID and that stays fixed and that's how I'll define a TCP connection or a UDP socket. And that means the higher order eight bytes can actually define where I'm currently, where this host is currently sitting at the moment. And if this particular host moves around, it can keep 11223344, but the higher order bits change. So the higher order bits are looked as the locator, and the lower order bits are looked as the um, EID or the ID identification. So that works pretty good with IPv6, right? There are some checksumming issues with TCP because today TCP looks at the full um, 16 bytes to do a, a pseudo header checksum. So there's some issues there, and people have addressed it various ways. We're going to address it a different way where you don't have to change the host when you deploy Lisp. Now, if you look at IPv4, there's not enough bits to split it up. There's really not enough bits to have enough uniqueness in IDs to support lots of connections in your host. And there's not enough bits in the locator side to be able to put enough hierarchy in the network. So what we have to do with IPv4 is we actually have to add another 32 bits somewhere. We obviously don't want to change the IPv4 packet format. That's pretty much a non-starter. But if we, put, if we put another 32 bits somewhere else in the packet, uh, maybe in a, uh, in a new header in front of it that we can then have the 32-bit locator in the outer part of the header and the 32-bit EID on the inner part of the header. And I'll show you that in a second. So that's how we would split up uh, or make a new type of address for IPv4. Now, you don't have to change that address, that 209.131.36, I don't know what that address is, I think it's Google. but. Um, that address could be the address that you currently use today for that host. You don't have to change it. So if that turns out to be a provider independent address, you just keep using it and you can use it um, as an EID now. Okay? If it's a PA address, then, and you stay connected to the provider who supports, who allocated you to 9131, then you just use that as a locator because it can go into its aggregatable um, system. Okay? So why do we want to do the separation? It, it provides a decoupling and a level of indirection that allows you to keep one thing fixed while you change something else. Now, by keeping the EIDs fixed, it means you don't have to renumber your sites, but now you have the option to re-home to new providers. You can switch service providers much easily. You could actually move a little bit. And we'd be very, we're very careful about using Lisp for fast mobility, but you could keep an, an EID attached to a host and the host could move while the locator changes depending if you're at home, you're at work, you're at Starbucks, whatever. Um, but we're careful about that because of the mapping scaling problem which we'll talk about in a second. So we're creating these separate namespaces that have different allocation properties. And the ter basic terms are we call these IDs and locators EIDs or RLOCs. And basically, the, uh, the end site, these EIDs are end site addresses for hosts and routers at the site. They're the addresses that you currently are using today. You don't have to change them. The records, the, the A records that go in DNS do not have to change. Those continue to stay the way they are today. We just call those addresses, those 32-bit values, EIDs. 
And we hope that those addresses are never seen as a destination address inside the core. That's the goal. And we want to make these globally non-routable. So as your site converts to Lisp, these addresses that you're injecting into routing now are withdrawn from routing. And then they, they're kept in your site. And it's your locators that are attached to your service providers which stay in routing. So day one, when you implement Lisp, you get the benefit. That's our goal. We don't want 50% of the internet to convert before everybody makes benefit. It has to, you have to benefit as you go or you will not go, right? So that's the way it has to work. Infrastructure addresses for Lisp routers and ISP routers don't have to change either, okay? All we're, all we're proposing is the sweet spot to deploy, to deploy Lisp is in the CPE devices at the site. You, and hopefully what we're trying to do is maybe this is only a software upgrade to those CPE routers. We may not even have to change hardware. And this is a fast deployment model that we could do. Hosts do not know about these locators. They're just, they're basically, uh, I, mean, I mean, I don't want to really say this, but they kind of look like a label on a packet that goes through the network. But, and I won't even um, associate it with a name of um, a certain technology. So basically, again, the R locs or the locators are in the core and the EIDs are at the site. And now we're going to talk about specifically what LISP is. So LISP stands for Locator ID Separation Protocol. The ground rules and the fundamental goals are is that we want it to be a network-based solution, which means you only have to make changes in very few devices at the sites to make this new architecture implemented. No changes to hosts whatsoever. We will not um, bail down from that. We have to have no changes to hosts. And we've been able to prove that so far in our pilot deployments. Dave will talk quite a bit on that. Uh, no new addressing changes to site devices, very few configuration file changes. We found that you didn't have to change any configuration files in existing boxes, but you do have to configure Lisp on the CPE routers. That's probably obvious. Um, and it's imperative that this thing be incrementally deployable. And it must and does work for IPv6 or IPv4. So we can do all combinations of IPv4 EIDs over IPv6 locators and vice versa. Basically, the model is called a jack-up model, which, was, which means you, you, you put a new IP header on the packet that comes from the, the, the host builds this packet right here, or builds these headers. And the um, destination and source, source and destination addresses here are the EIDs. So if it, the source address is the DHCPable address or the IF config address, the destination address is what you get from DNS. Nothing changes today. When the packet makes its way through the site to the CPE router, then the, the Lisp router supplies or prepends a new IP header, and in the outer header are the R locs or the locators. The source locator is the IP address of that router, and the destination locator is the locator that's associated with the EID that's in the header. And how you map from that to the next is going to, we'll, we'll present to you in the next couple slides. So it's called a map and an in-cap because you have to map the EID into a locator and then you encapsulate it. This is how the packet format looks. This is the outer IP header right here. And as I said, the source and destination routing locators go in the source and destination fields of the IP header. This is the guy doing the encapsulation. This is the locator. This is the CP router at the destination site that's associated in supporting this destination EID. This is the inner header built by the host. And we, we, put, we have a, um, eight bytes of Lisp, and we'll talk about these in a minute. And then we have a UDP. Very important why we use UDP as encapsulation. Because whenever you use any tunneling technology, those poor core routers that are attached to a directly connected router with a lag, they think it's a single flow, so they polarize all the traffic on one of the members of the lag. If you use UDP and the encapsulator changes the source port number as it encapsulates differently, then the guy who's attached to the lag thinks they're different flows. So the encapsulator actually does a five tuple hash on, does a five tuple on these fields and then sets the source port uniquely for that five tuple hash so the lag router knows to load split the traffic across the members of the lag. Really important. Also, we want to get through firewalls. I spent this last week trying to get my box working through a Linksys firewall, and it was really challenging. Actually, that wasn't the hardest part. <laughs> um, but anyways, um, UDP goes through firewalls much easier as well. Now, you can imagine that um, 
what we just showed you was this sort of thing where we had an IPv4 header that had locators in it, the Lisp, and then this is what the host did. Well, there's no reason why IPv6 could be originated by the host, and then we run it over IPv6. So this is kind of the homogeneous model. But we already see cases where what if two sites are running IPv6 um, from the host all the way to the border router, and the destination also does as well. Well, you can map, there's no reason why you can't map IPv6 EIDs into IPv4 locators. So we can have two sites talk to each other with pure IPv6. They don't know anything about IPv4, but we just use the infrastructure or the substrate IPv4, the capital I Internet, as we know it today as the transport between the two. So the CP routers would just encapsulate those V6 packets in V4. That's a no-brainer. It just works. And then this is the case where it could work the other way around. Say China goes to pure IPv6 and you wanted two IPv4 islands to talk to each other, you know, that's how you would do it. So we can work any combination here because an EID is just a sequence of bits and a locator is a sequence of bits. And the sequence of bits that you use for the locator, if it's a 4-byte value, you encapsulate with IPv4 header. If it's a 16-byte value, you, um, you, you encapsulate with an IPv6 header. Pretty simple. So there's no NATs that are required to be able to make this work. And arguably, if you wanted this to work, you might have to use some kind of NAT PT or that sort of thing, or do a double NAT to go from and to based on these uh, transition points. But here you don't have to do that. It's just tunneling. So what is LISP? There's a data plane and a control plane, obviously. The data plane defines um, how the encapsulation um, works and the decapsulation works and where you can put your tunnel routers. Like I said before, we think the sweet spot is at the CP router, but there's no reason why you can't put um, the encapsulator may be close to a server and a decapsulator closer to the edge. It depends um, if you want to take full routes, the full locator routes, you want to bring those into the um, site. There's all kinds of deployment ways you can do that. Um, we also, the data plane is also designed to give you some form of locator reachability. Um, those locator reachability bits you saw in the list header are used for that. We'll talk about that in a separate slide. And we have a data-triggered uh, mapping service as well as a control plane mapping service. At the control plane, we have to design a scalable mapping service. We have to be able to map from EID prefixes to a set of locators. And we've actually came up with four proposals that are called CONS, NERD, ALT, and Emacs. And we'll talk about that in a, in a second. The guy who does the encapsulation is the ITR. The guy who does the... Um, decapsulation is the ETR. And when we're talking about direction, and we're saying when the ITR does a mapping lookup, we meaning that should tell you that the packet is coming from a source in a site, going to an ITR that has to do a lookup to encapsulate. And then when we set, talk about the ETR, we're implying direction that the packet is coming from the core. When we refer to a box as an XTR, we're not talking about a uh, data flow. We're just talking about that object called the list box that's providing XTR, either I or E functionality. So let's go through a unicast uh, packet forwarding example. If you look at these two sites here, let's say that their EID prefixes are allocated um, from PI space. So here's one slash eight, and this guy's out of two slash eight. Has nothing to do with the topology that they're associated with. We have a source on the left-hand side and a destination on the right-hand side. They're both multi-home to separate providers. Now it turns out that the address of S1 is allocated 10001. It is a PA address from the provider that it's attached to. And S2 is the same out of provider B and it's a mirror image on the other side. Okay. Now what happens is S1 will want to talk to d.abc.com on the right hand side. It's going to get an A record back 2002. That's the same thing it gets back today. If you converted these two sites to LISP, it would still get that 2002 today. So what S is going to do is going to originate a packet from itself. Um, and there's a cockroach going across my keyboard now. You must not like LISP. That's interesting. Maybe he does like lists. Yeah. Okay. There, I got him. Okay. If he would have went across the screen, then I could have seen the policy route he took, right? <laughs> but anyways, um, so S, um, so S originates a packet from 1001 to 2002. And that basically just finds its way to the edge. And the reason it does is because 2002 is not in the IGP. It's not, it's not a sub, one of the subnets in there. So it's going to find its way to the, um, um, to the edge. Let's say this, the policy here in this source site is that he's S1 and S2 originating to default. So if S is closer to S2 and he's using a shortest exit policy, the packets are going to egress S2. 
let's just say right now for the sake of this example that S2 does have a mapping entry for the destination. It has a mapping database that's used at forwarding time. It has a, a mapping database that describes an EID prefix. He doesn't have to maintain every EID at the destination. It could be the EID prefix for the entire site. So we do have aggregation of routing table entries um, on a per site basis. So that EID 2 slash 8 will map to these two locators. These two locators are the IP addresses of those CPE boxes. And it turns out that this site has decided that those are, okay, what happens is this site goes to Aaron, and Aaron gives him 2 slash 8. And then the site goes to Provider X and says, I want to connect to you, I want to buy service, give me a locator so it allocates, it, it allocates D12002. And then they also go to Provider A and they get 13002. So the site basically puts this binding together and is, is um, configured in these two boxes, okay? Since we want to be able to support 10 to the 10th mapping entries, we can't have a central database. This is just similar to DNS, right? You can't put, at one time Etsy hosts worked, at a certain point it just doesn't work. So we have to make the database distributed, okay? And only the people that need to talk to who they need to talk to get it when they need to, okay? So what happens here is the policy at the destination site, they say I want to use both of these with the same priority, which means I want everybody to equal cost load split their traffic across these two locators. They're the same bandwidth, I pay the same amount, I want to use both of them equally, okay? And that's what the weights are. The weight is I want to do 50-50, okay? That policy now of the ingress traffic flow is done by the site and not by some core routers that are in that, you know, the provider A, in today's world, provider A may decide how they get to D, and it may not be through D1, it may be through D2. What if, what if site D wants to be able to say, I want all packets to come a certain way from provider A customers? So what happens is the, the, the packet comes to S2, S2 says, okay, I'm going to do a, a longest match lookup in my mapping database for 12002. I find 2002, I find this entry, and I'm going to hash, since they're equal, I'll do a hash to pick one. So for this particular EID thing, EID pair, I'm going to go ahead and use 12002. My IP address is 11001. I'm going to put that in the source, you know, so when this guy receives the packet, he does know that there's a locator associated with this slash 32, which is one of these locators. That's kind of interesting, too. There's a, an ability to glean, and there's an ability to spoof. So choose which one you want to do. You have to take the good with the bad. But the point here is, is that this guy then injects the packets of provider B. Now, what is provider B doing? He is not routing to D. He is not routing to 2002. He is routing to finding the shortest path to provider X. A packet has to get to provider X. And that's a BGP policy on how it gets to provider X. Once the packet gets to provider X based on shortest path AS or or best path selection based on what provider B decides, um, it could decide which way it goes. But once that packet gets into provider X, provider X knows it's for my customer. It's not, it's not only for a ho one of my customer's hosts, it's one, of, it's one of my customers that's on the other end of a PEC link that I have routing for. In other words, it's destined for 12002. So that packet will come over this. There's no, over this path. There's no other way it can come anywhere else. There will be no more specific route injection where 12002 will come in through this path. We have to not do that or we don't solve the routing table problem. So what happens is the provider X PE box right here decides just to send it over the link. The D1 guy says, ah, it's addressed to me. I just decapsulate. He decapsulates and then forwards it based on his IGP routing tables into, the, into D. And so that's basically it. It's just a tunnel between between the CPE, the ITR and the ETR, and it's all done on locator addresses in here. That's the fundamental idea. Now what's new and what has to be explored, which is kind of researchy that we learn every day about, is how to scalably get this mapping database. Go ahead, Dave. I just wanted to make a brief comment. I thought it was going to be easier. Um, Basically, Dina said it's a tunnel, but it's not, you know, how many people configure GRE or something like that on their routers? It's kind of a pain to manage that, right? The, these are dynamic tunnels. There's no interface associated with the tunnel. It's an encapsulation, and in that sense it's a tunnel, but there's no state in the CPE associated with that tunnel. And I th it's an important point because 
when we first started doing this, people said, oh, yeah, we could just put up GRE tunnels between all these things. And then we realized, well, first off, there's all that state. But secondly, we don't even know where the other ends are. So, and we didn't want to have to do the coordination job between, you know, here's your tunneling, here's your tunnel source and destination, all that. So it's a tunnel, but it's not like a GRE tunnel where you have an interface, some kind of interface or some state in either side. So, you know, us, us router vendors have built lots of technology that do, has done tunneling. And mostly when people think of it, it's always we've done it with interface tunnel zero. And that static tunneling stuff was always a scalability problem. Managing uh, lots of interfaces in the boxes, in these boxes, are much harder than managing lots of routing table entries. So like Dave says, is these are dynamic encapsulating things. I won't even call them tunnels anymore. But what we have to manage is a new database, which is this. So, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. We have to add something new to get this new thing. What we're adding new is this mapping database. And we'll, we'll continue to talk about that for um, um, the rest of the presentation. But of course, since I'm a multicast guy, I can't forget multicast. No solution would be complete without multicast routing, right? Everybody's going to shake their head here? Yes? So very... How many people have multicast running in their networks? Oh, so <laughs> Jose cares. <laughs> oh, so I can't skip over this. It's pretty simple, though, the multicast, well, maybe that's an oxymoron. <laughs> it, we, we still want to be able to keep the EID state out of the core network. And that's what we've done for unicast, so we must do it for multicast. You know, in multicast, we have these entries called S, G entries, which defines a source tree for, from S going to group G. So we want that, if that source state is EIDs, then we've taken this EID state out of the core for unicast, but we can't put it back in for multicast. So we have to have this consistent design goals for both of the types of forwarding paradigms. And we also don't want to do head-end replication, because as these video services come out, you're going to kill your head upstream link. So we have to actually run native multicast if you want to benefit from um, um, using replication where the divergent points happen in the network. And we want packets only to go to receiver sites. We don't want to be flooded everywhere. And again, we want to still not have changes to host, site routers, or core routers. Um, and we want to use existing protocols. We still have to make this incrementally um, deployable. So basically, we have these two types of um, entries, depending on where they sit. So we basically have to concatenate these trees. The trees that are built at the receiver site have to be concatenated at a tree that's running in the core that has to be concatenated with the tree that's running at the source site. Now, we believe that group addresses are pretty opaque values today. They don't define topology. They don't define identification, per se, for an individual host. They do identify a multi-participant sort of communication media. And so the group address is kind of an ID there, but it doesn't have to be mapped to location. So group addresses can be left alone. We don't have to deal with them for a locator ID split. However, if you build source trees um, from the receiver domain to the source domains, the source address has to be dealt with because we have to know if the source address is an EID or a locator. So that's why we distinguish between the SEID and the SRLOC. And basically, the SEID is the IP address of the source host, like it would be done today when it injects multicast packets. And that state is only kept in the source site and the receiver sites. And then those get mapped to um, SR locomages in the core. Here's an, an example. Let's say in the bottom two um, are receiver sites. And we have two receivers down here, one here. And that's the source that we want to join. Those green dots are PIM routers. Okay? So we're assuming we have native multicast running in the core and at the sites. What happens is, is when this receiver down here joins and he received, you know, he gets, he joins SEID comma G because he got it from a directory or a web page or whatever. But he's actually wanting to join the host. So that, that join will follow the exit path as well. And of course, what the ETR has to do now is find the locator that's associated with this SEID. And it just like when it's sending a unicast packet, it has to do that. It now has to find what the R loc is, the locator is for sending a join. So don't forget, multicast, you know, unicast works like this. I send you routes, you send me packets, right? In multicast, what happens is you send me routes, therefore I can send you joins, and then you return multicast packets. So it's a three-step process. So here you have to stand on your head and say the, the mapping entries are used for the join packets so the multicast data packets can come in the op opposite direction. So what happens is that this guy then finds out, this R11 finds out that SEID has a mapping 
for this site and that there's two locators, S1 and S2, and then it decides to use S2 based on the priorities that we showed on the previous slide. There are a separate set of multicast priorities from unicast priorities, so your ingress policy could be different for multicast versus uh, unicast, okay? So what happens is this guy launches a PIM join throughout these boxes for S2 comma Arlo. Of course, these guys have routes for S2, this 11 network, because it's in the locator space. So these guys, these PIM routers only keep the locator um, stuff. Once the, what happens is once the packet's here, this guy knows he needs to forward data packets that he receives, but he doesn't know the EID that's associated. He doesn't, he has to build this part of the tree. So this guy also, over the top, has to send an SEID comma G join to complete this part of the tree building. So he does that, so there could be a, an EID comma G state in the source site. Then when the, and then okay, then I'm saying down here, this guy does the same thing. And then what happens is we find right here is the fork point. That's where the replication will occur to send the packets to do different sites. Oops, go forward. And so the data, the data forwarding would occur here is that the packet would travel on an EID-based tree in the source site. It then would be encapsulated with 11001 as the outer header. G would stay the same. The packet would be forwarded here. These guys would all RPF on the address that's in routing. It would come down this link, that link, and then the, the SEID trees here would forward internally. And that's how multicast would work. And that's showing how it would work, what the packets would look like. Questions? Not simple, right? Debugging is not bad. It, and Dave, Dave will go through all of that. It's really miraculous how we can use the existing network management tools because we made the right choice on the mapping database algorithm. And thank you for the segue to the next part. I think there's a question. Oh, next question? Go ahead. Can you use, oh, can you use the microphone, please? I'm being asked. Sorry, the question is more, maybe not technical, it's more from the political side. In, and what happened with the privacy? So if you have to divided the information in two sides, who coordinates that table that said who is who? And the second question is, I'm uh, part of the CCTLDs organization in Latin America. How does CCTLDs need to make changes in the internal process to, for example, have lips in .pe in Peru or something like that. Thanks. Okay, let me answer the, the first part. So the privacy of information is um, just as private as the routing information today. This is routing information. Um, yes, anybody could find out who www.abc.com is, um, and you can also find out if for a particular ID prefix who the locators are. Um, so it is public from that standpoint. Um, if you want to authenticate that those, the bindings are right, we have to figure out a way to authenticate the bindings to make sure that someone's not spoofing um, something. Yeah, go ahead. We're kind of, um, what we're kind of hoping is that the CIDR working group and the IETF will provide us some solution, some tools for this. We're trying not to reinvent the wheel, basically, on that. You know, I mean, if, if they come up with something good, you know, some certificate, uh, structure that we could use either directly or with modification. We're going to try to do that. I mean, what's your thought on that? Does that make sense to you? When I go through the example of Lisp Alt, you'll see that how we use BGP and that we could use CIDR possibly to solve that sort of that problem. Now, in terms of the processes, I'm definitely going to turn that over to Dave because <laughs> that's a hard question. Uh, allocation. I, I'm assuming. Do, the, do their allocation, address allocation policies have to change now and do their processes have to change? I was a little bit confused about your question because you prefaced it with the CCTLD thing, which is sort of a DNS question, right? Okay, the DNS, as I think Dino said, the DNS really doesn't need to change at all. At all. What goes in the DNS are these EID things. Um, uh, and from the perspective of I guess LACNIC or whoever is, is actually um, allocating addresses to people and whoever's controlling the CCTLD, I don't think they'll see any operational change. 
as far as I understand. Yes, but in a special case in Latin America, you have some CCTLDs that have the first blocks IPs, so working at both sides. So um, for, for that way is my question. I, I'm not sure I understand. What do you mean by first block? Uh, um, um, how to say? Uh, when I'm sorry. In, when in Latin America the CCTLDs started, uh, started with the first block of IP number, so they delegate directly to the to the user, final users. So they have, uh, in that side, a responsibility to the, not only with the domain names or with the DNS, they have a responsibility to, like Lears, for example, in Mexico or, or Brazil, that have maybe. Um, oh, are you saying that they that you're doing the address allocation yes, as well yes, as the? Yes, oh, okay. I'll yes, talk they about. have the both functions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That um, that's a really good question. We have been work. So the question really is, let me see if I can summarize. Okay, I think the question is, how do EIDs get allocated? Is that right? Okay, um, I'll talk about that, but um, briefly, we don't know. But what we're hoping for, and this will become clear when Dino talks about this is a little more, when he talks about list alt, what we're hoping to do is build a, a, a hierarchy delegation where the RIRs are at the top. So LACNIC, we, we're working with Roque as a sort of proxy for LACNIC right now. We have Ripe Aaron and APNIC. And we're trying to work with them, and we'd be glad to work with you too, to kind of get a better sense of what would work for you guys. Because I think, you know, because, you know, hasn't gotten to this yet, but because the EIDs also need to be aggregated, it makes most sense to have the um, RIRs at the top of the delegation hierarchy. The difference, I, there's a lot of differences in that from today's model, for, and not the least of which is the RIRs don't really have an operational role right now. You know, and and it's not only Lisp that's saying RIRs need an operational role. It will be there for CIDR, too. So, you know, keep an eye on that while we're talking and let us know what you think. So what do we do when a Lisp box, an XTR, has no mapping? So we need a scalable EID to locator mapping lookup mechanism. And um, basically, there's only so many ways to skin a cat. Um, we could um, push everything to everywhere or we can pull it when we need it. Um, pushing everything everywhere has transmission costs, storage costs, lookup costs. Um, query and reply is more on demand. You, you store only what you use, but there is a lookup latency issue. Okay? Um, so you can have packet loss characteristics. Um, we don't think at the scale we want to build that that we can make it like a BGP routing table. There's just too much stuff to put around. So we do model it off of more of a query reply uh, DNS type model. So how does one design a, multi, uh, a mapping service? You need to map before you encap. Um, so we we needed to trade off push versus pull. So we looked at this um, proposal called CONS where we did a hybrid where we would push EID prefixes at the higher level of the hierarchy and then we would pull by sending requests along that. After thinking about that we said well we could probably push EID prefixes all of BGP and do them in highly aggregated ways because we're not uh, dependent on the physical topology and the business relationships between interconnects, providers, so forth and so on. So we thought by running another instance of BGP on a tunnel topology, which is what ALT is. ALT is a alternative list topology. Um, we thought that had the most promise. So let's just look at ALT and see what it is. So the mappings um, are still authoritative at the site. You still have this database which is completely distributed. Everybody configures their own um, mappings, their own EID to, uh, locator mappings, just like you would do in your own domain names for DNS. And you would advertise the EID prefixes in, in BGP, not the BGP you know and love, a new instance of BGP that perhaps runs in a different VRF that runs over a set of GRE tunnels. Those GRE tunnels are static, they are secure, and they are pre-configured on each end. Um, the ITRs then get the mappings by sending routing a map request, which is a new list control message, over this VRF or this alternate topology. And so the map request is following a path based on the BGP ID prefix announcement. And then it actually, the MAC request actually makes itself to the right place, to the destination site you want to send data packets to. 
and then the map reply comes back from that ETR. Go ahead. Uh, one way to put that a little bit more simply maybe or um, summarize that is, so you have this other version of BGP, same thing BGP, everything the same BGP, but it's running on an alternate topology in a different verb. Okay. And the only thing the thing is used for is so that you can send map replies and those map replies will find their way to the ETR that's authoritative for the mapping. Now why does why does it find its way to the ETR that's authoritative for the mapping? Because that's the ETR that advertises the EID prefix into this alternate thing. So it works, so it's only used for that one purpose. So keep that in mind when you're listening to this. So this, so what Dave just said is gonna be shown right here in this pictorial. We see we have these EID prefixes on the right hand side um, and we have these new boxes that you deploy on the on network. They don't have to go in existing routers. They could actually go in Linux systems. They can go in low cost routers, but we call them list vault routers. And those are the things that are connected together with these GRE tunnels, okay? So the sites, the ETRs themselves over here, ITR in the ETRs can be connected to list vault directly, or you can have just the GRE tunnel into it and so they don't have to run BGP. We wanna, we're gonna have these different versions of low OPEX um, XTRs that you want to be able to implement. And so the idea. Just to say one more thing. Good. Okay, so the dotted line, the low OPEX thing, all that comes down to is um, how many people have customers that you statically route? You, you have statically route, right? Well, all that is is a statically routed customer. They don't run BGP. Statically routed for purposes of this alt thing. So what happens is this alt router would say uh, 24210 slash 24 is reachable over this tunnel and therefore I'll inject it into BGP and advertise it to all my eBGP peers that are over this tunnel specifically. So what happens is these two guys here that are running BGP would advertise their prefixes into this guy and then this guy would do an aggregate aggregation, right? If somebody somewhere else needed something out of 240.1, you could just rehome the tunnel, put a tunnel right here. It doesn't matter where they physically are. We believe, and I mentioned this on the RG list um, yesterday, that this will run and scale better and be more stable than the underlying BGP because the topology won't change that much. The tunnels won't flap because the underlying infrastructure is robust to keep the tunnels up. And you will always rehome to this address allocation hierarchy, not physical topology hierarchy. So you can actually get, we can actually get really good aggregation in the core here. That's the goal. So what happens next is that this guy wants to send a packet here to 241.1.1.1. And the ITR does not have a mapping, so he can't encapsulate right now. So what he has to do is he has to find the mapping. Of course, this guy's the guy who has to answer because he's got the database entry for this EID prefix. So what happens is he will inject one of two methods, a map request or the data itself. We have the school of thought that you can't drop that data packet. So I want to be able to deliver that data packet. So what happens is we say we have something called a data probe where the data probe is actually sent across here and then this guy treats it as a map request and replies back. Now the people who hear that then say, oh, data probes are gonna take a longer path than the underlying. I'd rather not have that happen. So the other way you can do it is you can drop the packet and send a control packet called a map request. Well, we support either way and we default to sending map requests. No more discussion on that because it's been driven to death for the last 18 months. So what happens is this packet, as you can see how it's addressed, is the outer header contains the EID, the same as the inner header, and that's sent on the tunnel. Now the, all these routers know how to route to these addresses because it's in a different infrastructure, right? So the packets are then sent hop by hop over these tunnels and they make their way to the ETR. The ETR says, ah, that's for my EID. Right? And these tunnels, these eBGP connections are secured with MD5 or SHA-1 or whatever you want to use. Um, and maybe later in the future can use CIDR so we can actually authenticate these, uh, um, origin, these EID prefix originations. But what happens is that the ETR then will then decap the packet if it's a data probe. If it's a map request, you just send a map reply back. And that map reply goes back underneath. He knows the source which is this box right here. So he sends it back to the source of the map request and he uses himself as the source for the map reply. And the map reply just, it goes back underneath. And then the guy 
gets the mapping entry, and then subsequent packets get out encapsulated. That's fundamentally how you have to do it. Now, Dave will talk more about this, but if you want to find out which paths your map request is taking, you just put this box, you tell the CLI there that you want to go in a non-default verf, to maybe the list verf, and you type in ping or trace route, and you will see your trace routes will flow over here, and the responses will come back. So you already have tools. We don't have to invent a lisp ping or a lisp trace route, that sort of thing. And if you decide to trace route from this source to this destination, you find the three segment path. The first segment path is the path through the IGP. Then you find the path between the ITR and the ETR. And then you find the path from the ETR to the destination host. All those will show up in your trace route. So we don't use tunnel mode where the ITR, ETR hop looks like one hop because people want to know which way the, the network is taking. So you find the path that the EIDs are taking, you find the path that the locators are taking. Do you want to add anything or not yet? I'll have to speed up to get to you. I'm going to breeze over this really quickly but because I want to get to, uh, Dave to tell you about deployment because I think it would be more of interest to this group. But we do have a mechanism for locator reachability which we keep out of the mapping database. If D1 goes down, or its link goes down, or the PEC, the PE goes down. We don't take the locator out of the mapping entry and then tell everybody about the mapping entry. That will be too much, um, the frequency of that will be too great, and we'll then flap this mapping database. So we're doing locator reachability inside um, the data plane by using these locator reachability bits. And as long as these two guys are up, they're advertising both of themselves with these bit patterns, saying that they're up, so these guys know to load split traffic. And when one of these three conditions happens, D2 knows about it, and D2 then just advertises itself as being up, and then subsequent packets just flow to D2. Um, we, there are issues, and there's been discussions about failures that happen here, but I don't want to bring that up now because I know we're running out of time. But so just the high order bit here is that locator reachability is not inherent to the mapping database mechanism because we want those changes to happen only at subscription time changes or um, policy changes, that sort of thing, which is not very often. We assume these changes are going to be once a day. And this is why we claim that LISP uh, may not be suitable for high-speed mobility. If you have a handset on a high-speed train and your locator is changing at high speeds, do you want to update the mapping database at that rate? And our answer right now is no, you don't want to do that. You solve that with some other solution. LISP, if mobile IP or mo mobile v IPv6 is running, it can run on top of LISP and that, that all that stuff works. Now what we have to do is, what about a LISP site that's converted, has to talk to a non-LISP site? What do we do? Well, we have two solutions to it. One's a NAT solution, unfortunately, and one is a proxy tunnel uh, router solution, that which you, we think is uh, probably much better. And it may provide some revenue opportunity sources for providers, interconnects, governments, third parties, whatever. So we have to get all these four combinations to work. Well, non-list to non-list is the combination that works today. List to list works fine because you can encapsulate, and since you don't have to change the core and the sites, that's really easy. That's everything we've explained so, so far. But these two other cases we have to um, be able to support. We have to support a list site, um, and we call it list R, which means its EIDs are actually routable. That's what the R stands for versus non-routable. Um, and it depends if you have PI or PA space. What we really want to do is support this last case because we want, when you convert to Lisp day one, we want you to be proud of it. We want you to say, I withdrew my prefix from the internet core. I'm being a good citizen. You know, you're not, we have to invent some term equivalent to green that you're, you're L and not green or something. I don't know. Green. <laughs> yeah, something like that. So here's an example on how it would work with um, NATs. Let's say the left-hand side are all old systems. Right-hand side are LISP systems. That's why they're in green. Of course, their prefixes are non-routable. And of course, these prefixes are routable or nobody would be able to talk to them today. So those, those prefixes are in routing, okay? And I made them red because they're locators. Now what happens is if this guy wants to talk to this guy, he knows if he's a LISP site or not by looking into the alt. If he looks into the alt and he sees a prefix for 1.2 slash 16, he knows that that site is participating in LISP. Now let me send the map request, get the map reply, and I can encapsulate. Life is good. But if I want to, uh, so he d that's what he does, and he encapsulates. Now this guy down here, 
wants to send a packet to 65333. He looks in the alt and says, that's not in there. It's not an EID. Therefore, it's probably a non-list site. It's, it's this site. So what do I have to do? Well, I could go ahead and inject this packet, and it could make it all the way through here because we know 65 is in the, um, in the routing table. So we know the packet will make it all the way there. But we know that the return packet won't because this 1333 is not injected in the routing. Remember, this guy's a list site. He withdrew, and he's being L or green or whatever. So he, um, we, don't want him to, we don't want that 133 to be injected. So what he has to do is he actually has to translate that source address to address that's routable. Well, he could translate it to his R load because we know that's routable. So if he does that, then the packet can actually go there, and it could actually return and then gets translated. So this is kind of the local uncoordinated solution where you want to do it and you don't want to be dependent on any infrastructure boxes to help you. And it's only a one-to-one -one NAT. Um, it doesn't do port translation. It's a very simple form. And we think that this might be the way that you'll have to do it for IPv4. However, for IPv6, you may want to use the PTR version. Let me explain the PTR version now, and you can make your own your own assessment of it. So we have the same sort of thing here, and 65 is being injected into routing for these legacy sites. And so is 66 is being injected, because these are the locators for the LISP site. They're being injected, of course, because they're PA addresses. Now what we do is we introduce these things called um, PTRs. They're proxy tunnel routers, and they're each given locator addresses as well. Okay, But what they do is they are going to represent or help connect you, the non-list site, to the list site. So they're going to inject, and this is key phrase here, very coarse prefixes into the internet. They're going to make, their mass lengths are going to be very, very small. So they're going to attract, they're going to try to attract traffic from non-list sites going to list sites, okay? So for instance, when this guy wants to be able to talk to www.lisp.net over here, that he's going to get a 111 back. That's going to be in DNS. That's going to be non-routable because we want this guy to be green. And so this guy's going to inject this packet. And the packet, he doesn't have to, he, since he has no Lisp awareness at all, he's just going to send this packet into the network. Well, it's going to be attracted to the closest PTR because he's BGP advertising the EID prefix. So what we're saying here is by injecting maybe for IPv4, 10 to 20 prefixes that are very coarse that describe the entire LISP um, infrastructure. We're able, to we're able to save tens of thousands of routes by injecting 10 more. You know, you have to pay a little bit of tax. You know, it's the Obama plan. Pay a little now to get a lot more later, that sort of thing. That's kind of what's going on here. Now, for IPv6, since we have so much address space, we think these PTRs can just inject a single route a slash 16 maybe, an IPv6 slash 16. So for IPv6, it's really zero cost. Where for IPv4, if we want people here to be used their existing addresses and turn them into PIs, then there'll be PIs all over the place. So can we get away with injecting slash 8s, slash 7s, slash 4s? Not slash zeros, but that sort of thing. And we spray them across this array of PTRs that could be deployed maybe close to list pops, non-list pops, or as, um, or maybe they get deployed here. We don't we don't know the answer to that yet. But the idea is is that they attract these packets, and then these guys act as proxy ITRs, and then they know that the destination is um, Lisp, so they encapsulate the packet, and that's basically it. And of course, the return packets will go to 65.1.1.1. Those packets will happen natively because the destination is routable. So the these boxes can only go one way. And we believe that if these have to be high-performance routers, that a high-performance router, it's easy to do encapsulation in hardware because the hardware machinery is always built just to prepend X number of bytes that are typically fixed. And so we can actually build a high-speed box to do this easier than if it was a decapsulator. Jose. Who, who operates those PTR routers? Third parties, governments, interconnect providers, service providers, universities, registries. Yeah, all, some, any, part of, don't know. Part of what's kind of nice about it is um, you could always deploy a PTR for a piece of address space that you had if you wanted your list customers uh, to get better performance. But there's, there's nothing that would stop you from doing that. Like, so you've all wanted to have better performance for people who are trying to 
trying to reach U of O when it converted to Lisp, we could we could deploy one, and then the distance between the PTR and the site that you were trying to reach would be like one hop, right? So, whereas if it was maybe deployed in Andrews House like it is, it might have to go across, go back, you know, out there and back, right? So there's no reason why mod like what Dino said is we don't want to pollute the routing, you know, the DFC too much, but there's no reason why you couldn't do it. Now, and that answer could be different depending on IPv4 and IPv6. In IPv6, you may have to push it closer to the non-list site because you may not have IPv6 along across diameter. But for the IPv4 case, you could use what Dave said. Dave, you're up. Dave's going to talk about implementation. So part of this was um, we, uh, I remember talking to Dino about this early on and right after the Amsterdam get together and we were trying to decide whether or not we should do an implementation and one of the things that we decided was that we thought it'd be a lot of fun and we wanted to have more fun. So this was pretty much fun and it continues to be fun. So we have a, a prototype implementation that, that Dino has done which is it runs on a box called, I don't know if that's in this, but okay. And, uh, it support okay. So the prototype implementation supports these specs that are out there on the um, on the uh, IETF site. It's all software switching. It does it does uh, list for v4 and v6. It does um, ITR, ETR, PTR, and list NAT. We oh by the way we decided not to do NAT for list uh, for six, um, and I still don't think people should be doing NAT for six, but they are. Okay, so here's the platform that we have. Um, it's called, it runs on NX OSs, which is one of the 10,000 Cisco I, uh, OSs. Oh no, it's only 5,000. Um, uh, and uh, it runs on this, which is sort of the titanium is the name of the kind of, uh, it's just a, a one RU PC with a, with a 3.2 megahertz processor in it, a bunch, of di uh, it's a bunch of disk, a bunch of memory, and a bunch of gig E ports in it. Um, you can think of it like it's, it's like the Juniper Olive was, right? It just, uh, just a, a POSIX kernel development environment. Uh, yeah, and it can run on the Nexus 7K and some of the service blades, and uh, we're looking at expanding that right now. So here's the, here's the story. We started right after the Prague ETF around March of 07. Uh, we, we're building a pilot network, and I, um, people keep on calling this a pilot network, but I just want to say one thing here is that what I noticed was I worked on a lot of these kind of experimental networks like the M-Bone. I worked on the M-Bone a lot. And there was a real difference here that I haven't been able to quite communicate to people yet, probably my, my inability to do so. But basically, in the case of the M-Bone, you were running over DVMRP tunnels and you were never really going to do that in reality when you, know, when you got to have a full deployment of uh, multicast. Well, I guess Fenner and Van thought you were. but. Um, you, you never were going to build that as your real network. In the case of Lisp, the way it's being built right now is exactly the way you would build it. So it's not exactly, it, what I'm trying to say here is it could actually evolve, evolve into the real network without changing the architecture, um, which is qualitatively different than, say, like the Sixbone was, right? Sixbone was running over tunnels and all of this other kind of stuff. Um, yeah, there's over 90 release bills. I don't know if what that's a statement about, you know, maybe we find a lot of bugs. <laughs> we find a lot of bugs. Uh, and yeah, we have phase testing, system and unit testing. We have John Zwiebel out there doing that. We, 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 we built a network, we'll show you the network, but it's been very instructive um, just to get, a, to get code in the field. It's been a lot of fun and it's been very, very interesting. And then we've, been, we've enlisted a lot of uh, people who are helping us and we'll see that. Um, but it's sort of an all-volunteer effort, even within Cisco. It's not a, it, you know, even within Cisco, we're not quite there to, and, and this is all sort of pro bono work on our part. So, okay, here we go. iOS, iOS implementation underway in various forms. Um, XR is considering an implementation. OpenLisp, it's been available for a while. Um, Luigi and his friends, Luigi's, I guess, at uh, DT Labs now. And then these people in, uh, at the University of uh, Louvain, I, I believe, have been working on this. Um, he's a couple of, oh, and the people at NL Labs are also trying to splice into the existing LISP network using OpenLISP. The problem is that um, we've evolved the LISP spec just a little bit faster than Luigi, who's the developer, um, can stay with it. So they're, a little, they're one or two versions behind. Um, we're looking at a, a Linux, either native Linux or maybe even a port of uh, Luigi's OpenBSD. And 
Um, if anybody knows about other efforts, let us know. I don't know. Somebody asked me on the RRG or somewhere yesterday if there's another um, vendor implementing list, but I don't know of any. If anybody does, let me know. So we have this pilot network. I don't like that term again, um, but yeah, and no, I don't worry about it. Um, it's been out there for a couple of years. There's, there's really more like 30, 30 to 33 sites. It depends on who's up when. Um, they're all over the place. We have some in the United, a lot in the United States. There's some in, uh, in the United Kingdom, um, all over, Uruguay, Japan, et cetera. Also, we'll see a picture of that in a second. Um, they're all on the titanium. Um, we're working right now. Okay, so there are two guys, Luigi and his student have titaniums, but they have open list boxes that they, they're trying to get to interoperate. And then, as I said, these, these guys from NL Labs in Amsterdam also um, are trying to get going. And again, there's this version skew on the specs, um, which is stopping them. But they've been doing quite a, quite a bit of work trying to get going. And I really want to see uh, uh, open list come onto the pilot network or whatever we want to call it, not only because it'll give us two uh, implementations that are interoperating, but we're going to find a lot of bugs when that happens. So we're looking forward to that. Um, we have a couple of EID prefixes. Uh, 153.16/16 was, if you who is on that, you'll find out that that was graciously given to us by Andrew Partan, who lifted it up from UUNet at some point. Uh, and then this uh, slash 32, um, we bought that from Aaron. They extorted it. They extorted 500 bucks for us. Experimental prefix. Uh, so then, whoever, whatever your Arlokes are. So these are the EIDs, right? So all the all the stuff in the list space is, is numbered out of 153.16.16 or the uh, 32. See, I can't even say that. I can't, how do you say that? 2610D032 or whatever. I don't even know. Okay, and so all the, all the EID stuff. So any hosts, um, any loopbacks on the, on the uh, routers um, are addressed out of this space. And then the RLOCs are all the ones that whatever you have, like at U of O, our, our RLOCs are uh, numbered out of 128.223.16 because that's our, that's our prefix. So there's another little piece of this. Um, we built this Lisp alt thing that Dino described, but we, we decided we'd number the GRE tunnels out of 240-4. Uh, Vince and Elliot and I wrote a draft saying, why don't we just take the Class E space and give it back so that people can use it. There was all this kind of politics about it, and, and basically it came down to the following. If you give more IPv6, for, if you provide more IPv4 address space, it'll, it'll uh, um, slow down the IPv6 deployment. That was the argument that was made by Elaine and those types. But we're using it anyway because it's out there. Um, our implementation will support it. Most implementations do. Oddly, Linux will not yet. Um, Mac OS does. Uh, anyway, so we did. So we're using that to, to number all the tunnels. And uh, we're also using 36, 32-bit uh, uh, AS numbers um, for the alt. And we started out in AS dot, but with the big, you know, we couldn't decide as a community whether or not we should use AS plane or AS dot, so we're supporting both. Has anybody, has anybody used either of AS dot or AS plane yet? Which one? Did you say yes? Which one are you using, plane or dot? You're using plane? I, I don't know. I can't get behind it. I can't read it. You know, it's like, w w what's your AS number? Blah 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 blah. And then you have to talk for a while. You know, whereas if you could just say something dot something. So it was nice to have AS dot, but community is going in a different direction. Um, uh, so then the EID prefixes are advertised via this alternate BGP in the in what we're calling the list verf, but it's just another verf. Hey, by the way, how many people know what verf technology is? Okay, so basically the only, the, the only thing you need this for, you don't really need that technology. What you need is a technology where you can have another address space because since the GRE tunnels are in the RLOC space, those have to be separated from the EID space, and that's the main thing. If there was another technology to do that, well, maybe. But one of the things we wanted to do here was we wanted to reuse all the technology that's out there, so we didn't have to invent this. Very little code to get the alt thing to work. It just uses standard BGP stuff, standard um, VRF technology, and a little bit of glue from Dino. Example of another technology would be if you, if your router did a virtual router implementation, was be, been able to be segmented that way. That would be an, another way of doing this, right? Because I mean, the, the basic the basic issue here is that 
the endpoints of the GRE tunnels that the that the VERF, that the ALT is built out of are not in the LISP VERF and can't be. So we use that technology just just so we could reuse it. Okay, so here's um, the friend from LACNIC out there. I'm sorry, I forgot your name already. Um, I want you to take a look at the picture. Here's what we built um, for the ALT. So basically the idea here was, and this is kind of the feedback that, uh, some feedback I'd like to get from you folks, is that, I guess there's no pointer capability. Oh, I guess you have to do this, right? So in this case, what we were thinking was, since we want these EID prefixes to be aggregated, we'd like to see the, the top level, a sort of a top level um, of this hierarchy allocation consisting of the RIRs. And here I have, you know, I have UY because the box that we gave to LACNIC is really, Roque has it, so it's at his university. So what we did was allocate a chunk of space for each one of these guys. Obviously, we don't have that much space. Only a clarification. I am not from LACNIC. I am from LACTLD. Okay. Uh, CCTLD Association, not the IP numbers. The gotcha. Lineage. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. So what we did was we allocated a chunk of space to each of these guys um, at the top level. And then, so they advertise only the most coarse uh, prefix amongst themselves, right, at the very top level. And then if you're in the Aaron region, you got a chunk from Aaron, and then you could you allocate all of these, uh, I'm sorry, uh, these guys are all just um, pushing around a less coarse, a longer prefix, but still a less coarse, and then they allocate um, uh, prefixes down, so all of the end sites have slash 24s. These guys are pushing around slash, I think, slash 20s, if I remember, because, you know, we don't have a lot of space out of slash 16, but, you know, it's a, for that purpose. And, and likewise, so, for example, over here, we've got these folks here in, in the UK, and um, Dino, we wanted to put Dino in a distant um, uh, to a distant R, um, RIR to kind of get a feeling for what it would be like to rehome. So if you had gotten your EID space from right because you were in Europe at one point and then you moved to San Jose, that would be the scenario that Dino's in, right? And he doesn't have to renumber. He just has to put a tunnel up to right, so that's what he has. So that's how we built this. So for example, and the, okay, there's one other thing here. So in the Aaron case, since we had so much, we started off in North America, what we did was we put another level of hierarchy, and what these three routers here are doing are doing aggregation sort of on the continental level. So this is sort of a quasi-geographic idea here. So these guys are continentally aggregating, these guys are aggregating for the entire planet, and these are the sites. And all of these sites are up and running, so they can all do all of these things that Dino just talked about. Okay, then we got a couple of domain names. We, we went through some iterations, you know. Obviously, Lisp.net and all of that stuff was going to be taken, right? I mean, you know. And the Lisp people, the actual Lisp programming people, they went berserk. I mean, it was really interesting, you know. It's like nobody's heard of Lisp in 100 years. And then, and then when we did this, they went berserk. So I tried to get Scheme, too, because I like statically scoping more than dynamic scoping. I couldn't get it, so it um, didn't work. So anyway, we put all the um, EIDs in Lisp4.net. So if you look at something like www.list4.net, you could trace to it or you can get on that website. That website, uh, that, there's, a, there's a C name that points to something that called, strangely enough, scheme.list4.net. And, and the reason I did that was because for a while we have, we have a couple of mirrors of that site and we were just playing around with ro what would happen if you were round robining against, against a lot of different list sites and you were going through this PTR infrastructure. So we, we took one down, I think I took it down because one of them was broken, and it caused the thing to be broken, but now there are two other ones, so I should probably do it, put it back. And then if you go off to uh, www.list6.net, if you have six. Do we have six here? Do we have v6 here? Yeah, then this will work. Yeah, so here's the story. North America, you know, 20, um, you know, we, and, and then, you know, we just kind of broke it up in such a way that we thought we could get enough address to, you know, start building some of this. Now, it turns out that in some of these regions, um, we just don't have enough space. We need another prefix, but, you know, slash 16s aren't that easy to come by. And then in 6, what was 6 was a, a lot easier to do because it's a little bit more of a greenfield. So what I thought would be interesting is like, okay, so we have a 30, we have a 32. If we take the, so, so we're seeing the X here. If we take this, these bits and say that's the continent and then take the next bits and say that's the region and then, you know, give 48s to the site, that's what you wind up with. And that, that works pretty well, you know, and, and then the aggregation thing is really easy to see how it works. 
So we have a couple of things. Uh, so we've deployed. We one of the things that we what we've been that we've been trying to do is we're trying to make sure that the, we're trying to make this stuff work, right? So one of the ways of trying to seeing if stuff work is to actually try to deploy it. So we try to deploy a ton of stuff, you know, and we've learned that the the activity of deploying this has been really instructive. I mean, and you can ask John Kemp and Jose over there who helped me. I, I should say that. Let me say this now. John and Jose uh, are, uh, have put in a ton of time supporting me at U of O, doing this, racking stuff up, helping me, you know, work around U of O routing things and every other kind of stuff. Uh, so they've been very helpful. In fact, this translate.list4.net, which uses the translate <coughs> functionality that Dino was talking about, list NAT, I had to get Jose to put a route somewhere because that's how you do NAT and so forth. So thank you for that. But you can get on www.translate.list4.net right now and you'll see how it works. And then we have some PTRs, uh, proxy tunnel routers. We're also trying to play with this a little bit for various different reasons. One is because we want to, you know, work on the technology and debug the technology, but the other one is what does it mean to put these things in different places in the topology, which was kind of what Jose was questioning about. So right now for V4 proxy tunnel routers, there's one in Andrew Partan's basement in Maryland. He had the first one going. There's one at ISC, and there's one on Roque's box which, in Uruguay. I don't know what to call that. But you'd want to have some regionally and possibly close to um, high traffic sites. But, you know, we're still trying to debug all these kind of things. Um, and we've learned some stuff. Like, for example, the PTR needs to have very good cache management because, you know what, as soon as you turn on the background, let me put it this way, the background level of scanning that's going on on the internet right now is really, really stunning. I mean, every prefix is getting scanned continuously. So if you think about what that means for the PTR, the PTR is going to have to have a way of figuring out that it's getting scanned, manage its cache, and so forth. And so we've been working on that. On IPv6, well, you know what? Shockingly, it's hard to find IPv6 connectivity out there. Um, Fortunately, U of O has it, ISC has it, and Roque had it. So, as I said, you could go to www.list6.net. The way you get there from right here would be through, probably through either ISC or U of O. Somebody could trace to it and tell me right now, if trace six to it. And uh, uh, let's see, www. Oh, yeah, okay, this is a little bit out of date. I, I made www.list4.net be the same as www.ptr.list4.net. So. Um, either way, but somebody could trace route to www.list4.net and tell me how we're getting there now. Whether I, I would guess it would either go through um, Andrew or ISC, but I'm not sure. I haven't looked today. Anybody? Can anybody see? Okay, so I'll keep going. Um, there's other. We in the process of doing list, we we realized that. We, should, we probably should realize this at first, but basically, once you get this level of indirection, all of a sudden you can learn, you can do all kinds of different sort of things. So, you know, load sharing in data centers, load balancing in data centers um, is an application that people have actually come to us and said, hey, can we use this technology for that? Um, the truck roll thing, well, you don't have to renumber, so that's really nice. BGP free core, we're thinking about a way of doing that too. Um, Basically, you don't need to ex you really don't need external routes, if because you have this other control path, which is the map request map reply path. Um, you can build you can build different kind of to topologies too with flat ad addressing. And in fact, I think it was Peter was it Peter Lothberg who was the first one who came and said, um, "Well, if I can use IPv4 and IPv6 as EIDs, why can't I use MAC addresses?" And then, you know the answer is, well, you can. And then the next thing that he said was, can I do spanning tree? I said, no, I don't think so. And then you slapped him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then I said, no, I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, so you can use, yeah, and you can use Mac, you can do Mac address mobility with this too. It's just really kind of, these are all kind of like things that we really never thought of. And, it, and, it, and it's kind of encouraging because when an architecture can do things that you didn't anticipate it was going to do, like the internet does, it's usually a good sign. Oh yeah, okay, here's this thing. Okay, so, you know, obviously we work at Cisco and we're working on this, but we've gone out of our way um, really to have an open policy for Lisp because we, you know, Dino and I and Vince and everybody else who's working on Lisp really kind of feel like any technology that's core to the internet shouldn't be encumbered by any kind of IPR. 
and Dino's really been great by taking the lead with, you know, Cisco Legal and all of that stuff um, to try to make this happen. And so far, I think we've done pretty well. I don't think Cisco has intention. As far as I know, let me, let me be precise about this. As far as I know, Cisco has no intention to take IPR on Lisp. And we've gone out of our way with legal to say Cisco doesn't have an interest in taking IPR on Lisp. So, and, you know, we've encouraged people like Luigi. We funded Luigi to do open Lisp. We're trying to fund other people to do um, public domain versions of things like this, too. So for all of your, inf you know, for all of your information, we really are trying that. Um, we've worked in the IETF and the IRTF, and I don't know if anybody follows this, but wow, um, we're still trying. Let me put it that way. Okay, and so it's not Cisco only, right? Um, you know, we have all these people involved in this, and all of the documents, everything associated with Lisp is an internet draft in the public domain. And we, you know, we really would like to hit, so this is for you guys. Anybody wants to write code, anybody wants to splice into the Lisp network, anybody wants the titanium, um, you know, we're really interested in getting more people to work with us, get more ideas. And we need research. And fortunately for us, there is a lot of research. If you, if you Google Scholar for Lisp and Locator ID, you'll get a couple hundred hits. It's pretty nice. So it's an open effort. So here's the drafts. The first one, uh, uh, Lisp 11, that's the base spec. Multicast draft, well, and Dino talked a little bit about this. We haven't gotten around to multicast yet. The draft fuller Lisp alt describes the alt system. Daryl's draft on inner working describes PTR and um, a translate. By the way, there's a, there's a need for an operational draft here because it turns out that you need, to, you need to think about filtering carefully in the environment where you have any kind of proxy tunnel router. It's not specific to Lisp because the proxy tunnel router usually changes the source address. To, so you get a source address coming out of your site that doesn't look like it came from the, what's now the site prefix. So you, this is true for any proxy tunnel technology. So there's a, lot of, there's a need for an operational draft here um, if anybody's interested in working on that. The next one, EID block, well, I, I try to put a stake in the sand and say IANA, allocate us a, you know, you know the, recent, the, the way you usually get the IANA to do something is you write an internet draft and command them to do so. And so I just did. They ignored it, but, you know, extorted 500 bucks from me. Uh, and, oh, this last one. Okay, so we learned some lessons about the implications of the locator ID split, and we're trying, and, and, and some of them, most of them are, are problems that we need to solve um, in the technology itself. It's not specific to LISP. And so we felt it was really an important thing to say, hey, there's these problems with this technology that need to be solved. They're not insurmountable. But the interesting thing about this is, and this goes back to, hey, we wanted to do an implementation. This stuff, this locator ID stuff, split stuff has been around since 92 or, or before. I think, I think somebody, John Day or somebody told me it was actually Salzer in 75 who had the first instance of this. If anybody knows that, I'd be interested in that. But it wasn't until we got off and implemented it that we found this stuff that's fundamental properties of the architecture. So there's, you know, there's, there, there's something to that rough consensus. Well, I don't know about the rough consensus, but there's something to that running code stuff, you know. And okay, and then these in the middle here. These are some of these are older drafts, but I'll say this draft mathy list DHT thing. These guys had some interesting ideas. They said they thought, hey, can you use a DHT to do the mapping? It's an interesting idea. We didn't. I don't really feel like they really got there, but it's an interesting idea. And these on the bottom are just the um, are just the sort of the discarded mapping system approaches that we tried. And, you know, it's important to notice this because we tried a lot of stuff. We didn't know how to do this when we started out. And, you know, <coughs> yikes, excuse me. Um, Lisp is modular in its mapping system, so if in the future somebody comes up with a better idea, we can, we can try and implement, we can go off and implement it, right? And, and it's also not the case, we haven't, it's not the case that you might not be able to do inner working between alt and another mapping system, too. So there may be a way of it's not clear to me that you couldn't do that. So these things are, we've tried to keep these things extremely modular so you can do all these different things. Again, so, you, you know, if you can and you feel like you have the energy, sign up at uh, lisp.ietf.org. The IESG wants more people on the list. I mean, you know, get a proc mail filter though. I'll send you the proc mail rule for it though, really. And then you can get some more information if you want to go through four or six to either of those sites. Which I've tried to keep those 
fairly um, up to date. They're actually the same site, just get from one from different directions. And I don't, I'm not much of a webmaster, so you know, you'll see what I did. It's not beautiful. Oh yeah, and then, you know, here's the list thing. So, how do we do on time? So, can we, can we take a few questions or a few comments or anything like that, if anybody has one? Paul? Mike, Mike. <laughs> Paul, can you use Mike? <laughs> the Mike. <laughs> the Mike. I got kind of two questions. What do you, how fast do you think those internal mappings turn over? I mean, what's the, what's the propagation problems yeah. and so forth? Yeah, okay, so. There's two questions in that, actually. So the, the, the location of the mapping, the ETR that's holding the authoritative mapping can change as fast as BGP can change it. In other words, I could withdraw one and announce another one and it's just BGP. So we don't really want to do that because I guess this wasn't really said, I think Dino alluded to this, but if what we do is we take all the problems that are in the DFC BGP right now and put them in the mapping system, we haven't solved anything, right? So we're really trying to avoid that churn and deaggregation in the alt mapping system. That's the first thing. The second thing is, if the mapping changes while I'm holding a cached mapping for you, say, suppose you change your mapping and I'm holding a cached mapping. Is that your question? I, I'm just curious about the general. Well, so far we've seen low frequency, right? And we anticipate it will be low frequency because mappings are intended to be a subscription time kind of thing, not a, in, and that has to do with, like Dino mentioned, the mobility issue. So we're thinking it's going to be relatively static, because you don't rehome your site on much more, much quickly, much more quickly than like on a daily basis, right? Yeah, I mean, it seems like it, not, you know, I'm a DNS guy, so I think of this in DNS terms, but it seems to me that, you know, a half hour, TTL there with some way to detect failure when you go to an egress path that all of a sudden is dead. Yeah, Dino's got what is it? What is our TTL right now? Twenty-four hours. So twenty-four hours, but you know we're just we're just learning that right now. But, but, but we yeah, have the mechanisms but, that you just described. But but you're talking about a reachability issue, and you you'll go to an egress box that will see the list of locators regardless if they're up or down. It will have separate status bits knowing if it's up or down by hearing data packets from it and the, using those located reachability bits. So I made it very, well maybe not clear enough, that um, we do not take locators out of the mapping database when they go down. So, so they're always there, they always describe what your connectivity to the internet is, but it doesn't mean if you're up or down, it just means I know that I have these CPE boxes connected to these two providers and those are the locators to use. And when I'm about to use them, then I look at these other set of bits called lo reach bits to find out if they're up or down. And that was the locator reachability slide where we were showing, okay? And how often do those bits change, do you think? Those bits can change pretty quickly depending on if routers go up and down or the site partitions and stuff. Um, those are being transmitted in the data plane, so we do have some good fast convergence there. But for only a certain class of failures, when if you and I are CPE routers and we're, we have our links each out to the net, and you know my IGP can detect that you've went down or we of our sites partitioned and when that happens when we both now are encapsulating packets to remote sites the locator reachability bits before I said I'm up and Paul's up and I'm saying I'm up and you're saying you're just up so people that want to be able to get one are one way or the other will will use the only up the locators that they hear from okay it's kind of nice about that is the remote site can detect uh, partition in the distant site yeah and it's done in the data plane, so you don't have control plane propagation time. You don't have the traditional queuing delays that you have in the control plane. You still have the queuing de delays in the data plane, just regular packet queue delays and that sort of stuff. But you're transmitting this reachability status in the data plane. Well, yeah, one other thing is, um, you want to talk about SMR a little bit? Yeah, go ahead. Um, go ahead. You oh, yeah. That's if, that's if you want to take oh. one out or add one, right? Right. So. Um, so, I mean, are you okay on that, on the way we, uh, now, we, what we want to go on to mention next is, what if you do change service providers and now that locator no longer is relevant and you want to either replace it with a new locator or just remove it from the locator set, what do you do there? And I mentioned, I talked uh, briefly to you about it um, at the last NANOG, but I'll mention it. We have this thing called an SMR bit, it stands for Solicit Map Request. 
And as I'm sending data packets to you, and somebody configures a locator to be removed from the locator set, I can, at my site, I can then say that um, I can rate limit who I send SMR bits to, so I can control the rate of map requests that come to me. So by me sending this SMR bit to you, I'm telling you, the remote site, to send me a map request. And when you send me a map request, I'll give you a map reply with the new information. Yeah, there's new information. It's basically you're signaling new information for you to come back and get from So me. we're using the same query reply, but this SMR bit is a notification of change. Rather than, if you, you know, I mean, you know the trade-offs, right? If I had to push this new mapping to everybody, I'd have to remember who is requested from me. And we know that it's not going to scale very well. Yeah, I, I think you're implying much more uh, understanding than I really have. But ah. <laughs> my other question is, uh, when, when you add these extra wrappers, I mean, what are the sort of MTU and packet size issues that you get into? Okay, great question. So um, there is a, um, we, we answer that question three ways. The first way is, and it's the easiest way to answer it, is that um, we want to say, and we know it's not totally true everywhere in the universe, that most, maybe 80% of the links and routers today support 4470. So we have plenty of room not to exceed MTU when 1500 byte packets are sent from the host. That's the easy answer. Everybody's going to raise their hand. Not true, not true, because I go through a DMZ that is 100 meg Ethernet, and I have 1500, and your Lisp is slapping headers on it that make it's making it go to 1540 or 15, uh, 1600 or whatever. So what do you do? So we have two approaches. Um, we have a stateless approach and a stateful approach. The stateless approach is, is that when the ITR wants to encapsulate and realize it's going to go over the 1500 limit when it puts the header on, it will then fragment packets and then encapsulate each one of them. It encapsulates them, sends them to the ETR. The ETR decapsulates and forwards each fragment, putting the onus of reassembly on the host. That's one. The stateless one is we run MTU discovery. And the way we do that is the host sends the ITR a packet. The ITR just encapsulates it. Um, it, it sends the packet if it can. If there's any path along the way that violates the MTU, we get an ICMP2 big message back. The ICMP2 big message comes from an intermediate core router back to the ITR. The ITR then notes what the effect of MTU is, stores that 16-bit value in the mapping entry, and then sends the two big message all the way back to the host. The host lowers it, so when the next packet comes, we can put enough on it to, to make, to be within the effective MTU. So that later approach is the stateful approach. Comments, questions, opinions, tomatoes? Oh. Ann. So slightly different question. Back in Dino's slide set, you had four connectivity cases. One was non-LISP and non-LISP. The next one was LISP to LISP. And then there are two cases where you have LISP to non-LISP. Now, can you say anything yet about the performance implications? In other words, the current state of the world is non-list and non-list pretty much. How do, how do any of those other three cases compare? Not so much, well obviously there's two parts. There's the getting started part, which you've gone through in you know, substantial detail. But there's also, once you've actually got the connectivity up, the steady state place. So if you have any thoughts or you've been able to do any instrumentation or um, you have hints about what people should expect, it also, of course, points out what's the story going to be? Is it going to be possible to claim that, you know, in a, in a wonderful marketing world, the Lisp world will be lower latency or faster or better in some performance sense than the current non-Lisp world? Yeah, I'll, I'll just take an operational view of that. Um, basically, with respect to non-LISP to LISP case, the non-LISP to LISP case, the, there were two solutions to that, right? One was this LISP NAT thing, and that, that has virtually, as far as we can measure right now, the, the impact of that is negligible, right? Because that's just NAT, right? I mean, that, that has the same properties NAT has, right? Um, exactly, in fact. Um, now, when you're talking about this proxy tunnel router thing, it will have it, it has, it has a, the, the performance, the question you ask is multidimensional in the space of that. And I'll just give you a couple of them. One is, if you're the first one to ever use the proxy tunnel router for the destination, then it's exactly equivalent to being behind a list 
world and asking for the destination. So all, whatever the mapping delay in latency is with that, okay? But there's another issue there, another dimension, and that is how far away from you, you're the source, is the proxy tunnel router, and then how far away is the destination, right? So we played around with that a little bit, you know? But that is actually, that is actually something that I think might be able to be monetized. Because if I'm at t or whoever, I'm a giant, you know, and I, I decide I want, I'm a Lisp world now, and what I want is I want for my, for people trying to reach my customers who are in the Lisp world from outside, I have an, I have a, I have an uh, incentive to put up a proxy tunnel router very close to the edge of my network because I'll, I'll be attracting the traffic in the, sort of on the path that it would go on, right? Not this whatever, you know? So the first one we put up was at Andrew's house, right? And they had this horrible property that, oh, if I wanted to send a packet to myself at U of O, I had to send it across the country and back, right? And so we, we recognized that right away, and that's just a property of any of these prop, uh, proxy tunnel techniques, you know, for any protocol that does it, right? But then we started uh, kind of me messing around with that and saying, well, what could we do to optimize that? And so then we put one up on the ISC DMZ, and that just changed the performance properties of a lot of things, you know? So there's a... It's, your question is really good, but the space is multidimensional. So I was going to throw out the easy ones first. You talked about the complex cases. Thank you for doing that. Um, so the list to list case and what a latency is going to be added. Um, so basically an encapsulation, decapsulation step are the extra things that are happening when a packet flows from a source to a destination across these multiple domains. And um, we've seen from many hardware implementations over the decades that encapsulation is not costing you that much. It's pretty much in the noise. So I think as long, you still will have your shortest paths between the two sites. So we won't see long latencies because of path changes. And you'll still get shortest path between there. And so the question is, is the encapsulation, decapsulation, does that hurt you? And it's pretty non-existent. So I think that case can run as well as the case for non-list to non-list as you see it today. Um, arguably, you might even get better paths because it's the shortest path to um, the last hop AS versus going through some securitous policy path. So we might get some better paths. Not sure. That's good. We'll have to do a lot of trace routes to figure that sort of thing out. Um, I mean, Dave said most of the ugly stuff that I wanted to avoid about the PTRs. If the PTRs are not placed close to where the sources are, they will have to go far, of course. Um, and to what I thought Paul's initial question was is how long does it take to get mappings um, what I just did as an experiment on Friday was since, you know, Dave said I'm connected to RIPE on the alt thing. So I have a two megabit upstream link through Comcast, and that's where I was sending my map request through over the GRE tunnels to RIPE, which was somewhere in the UK. And, and links, or where is it in? Uh, the RIPE router, it's, um, it's in Amsterdam. I it's in it's Amsterdam, Amsterdam, okay. In Amsterdam. And the, the RTT, of the, by the time I get the map reply back, it was about 100 milliseconds which was kind of surprising. So that was, that's what it would take, you know, if, if you had a fire hose of data, you'd be dropping 100 milliseconds worth of data for the first packet that went from this site to that destination site. And then everything else is, amber, you know, everybody benefits from the cache. Yeah, there's an interesting, uh, important point there that I think frequently gets overlooked is that that latency, the first packet latency is only for the first packet between the sites. Every other packet and every other host that sends a packet to the remote site now gets to use that mapping entry. So it's only the first packet so between sites. Not in reality, what is it? It's probably a DNS packet that gets dropped or a TCP SYN that's going to be transmitted three seconds later on the first connection that starts up from that, you know. So I don't know if it's a, a, that much of and a problem. We, we, we see this all the time um, on large layer two networks when I want to open up a TCP connection to you over a layer two network and ARP's going to do the same thing, right? So, And, you know, in, in sort of less quantitative studies that we do sometimes, you know, because, you know, you have this, it's 30 node network, it's not tiny, it's, it, it's tiny. It's not insignificant in terms of its geographical distribution, is what I'm trying to say, is that once the thing is up and running for a while, you really can't tell it's there from the user perspective. I know that's a qualitative thing, but you really can't, you know, and that, and we've done a little bit of trying to quantify that, but, um, we need, to, we need to enlist some researchers, you know, who have time for the, you know, some of the measurement folks, you know, the CADAs or whatever, you know, to really, to really put some discipline around that. Are we done?
Others? Okay, well, thank you guys. And I was instructed to tell you, I, I didn't want to say this too early, but apparently the food's back over on the other side. So, all right, thanks everyone. Thanks a lot.